Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, January 1st, 2024. Coming up on the show today, from the color purple, editor John Paul. We need a reason to remake the color purple. And his reason was Seeley's fantasies. He was rereading Alice Walker's amazing book. And he came up with the idea of going deep into her fantasies, which is really not so much in the Spielberg movie. I was very moved, and Blitz is a very, very thoughtful guy. And by the end of it, I was like, wow, I really want to do this. But in the middle of doing it, when I was trying to talk Blitz out of hiring me, I said, you know, you should really hire Tom Cross. I said, Blitz, do you want to look at these and give me notes? He said, no, 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 no. This is how I want to work. I want to come in. I want to sit with you, watch whatever is recut, whatever you have. We'll watch it, and we'll sit and talk about it, and we'll come up with notes together. And that's what we did through the entire movie. And I would say I probably spent 40% of the editor's cut working on the director's cut. Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. All right, welcome back everybody. How were your holidays? Did you get anything good? I got sick. How's that for a gift? The good news is that when I recorded today's interview, it was before I got sick. So you don't got to listen to me talk like this the whole time. Anyway, Happy New Year, my friends. Welcome to 2024. Let's hope it's a good one. I know today's episode is a good one because we have editor John Paul joining us today to talk about his work on The Color Purple. Prior to The Color Purple, John spent a lot of his time cutting for director Jay Roach on films like Bombshell, Meet the Parents, Meet the Fockers, Austin Powers' The Spy Who Shagged Me, and Austin Powers' Goldmember. Now, as far as The Color Purple goes, a little history lesson might be called for. The Color Purple was first a book by author Alice Walker, which was then made into a feature film in 1985, directed by Steven Spielberg. Then in 2005, a musical of the same name came out. So where does this new film fit into all of that? Is it a feature adaptation of the musical? Is it a reboot of the 1985 film with music? All of the above? None of the above? I think it would be best to let John explain all of that. And he will, but first, a few important details for us to take care of. Now, whether or not The Color Purple is a musical or a drama with music, either way, music plays a huge part in making a movie great, which is why you have to have great music for your movie. And that's where our friends and sponsor Extreme Music enter the picture. Since 1997, they've been the ones film and TV makers have turned to for the very best in production audio. What makes it the best? Well, that all starts with the talent, you know that. The biggest names in the world of composing and producing have lent their skills to Extreme Music's enormous catalog of tracks. And even though the catalog is vast, it doesn't mean it's hard to find what you're looking for. Their powerful search engine makes it simple to find what you need using keywords like tempo, genre, composer, even lyrics. They will give you back tracks where you can customize the instrumentation and even choose from different lengths. And for a real magic trick, you can upload a track to Extreme Music for reference, and they'll find you ones like it. You can do all of that, including the licensing, right there on the web. Or you can choose to talk over that licensing with a real nice rep at an office near you. So the next time you have a story to tell, make it sound its best with production audio from Extreme Music. Okay, here's another quick note for you. From time to time, I get messages asking me to clarify some of the things the guests say. Maybe it's a term you've never heard before, or a reference that the guest makes that you're not familiar with. And that's where the podcast format, as wonderful as I think it is, falls a little short. Well, did you know that many of these episodes of the podcast get reborn on the Frame.io blog where they are transcribed and brought to life with images, videos, and links to other multimedia assets that can really help flesh out the ideas we talk about here on the show. You can even listen to the podcast over on the blog and follow along with those assets in real time. And to help you find this treasure trove of riches, there is a link in the show notes that will bring you on your way. Now then, time to get going with the first episode of 2024. From the color purple, here's editor John Paul. Julia, your charming and lovely wife of 400 years, how long would she say it's been? You know, the publicity people were great because I wrote up my bio and I was sure they would change that. But it's been a joke of Julia and mine for years when people would say, how long have you been together? 400 years. We actually have known each other for 49 years. We were high school sweethearts. We went to a crazy hippie school in Vermont and ran across the country together. And we're still together. We're best friends. I know you've done a lot of films with director Jay Roach. I've seen many of them. I've enjoyed all of them. But with The Color Purple being only the third feature, I think, for director Blitz Bazawule, you probably haven't worked with him before. So tell me about how you came to be on this project and meeting with Blitz and what you guys talked about. I'll start off with a a little short 
history of Blitz. Uh, he is a, uh, as Blitz the ambassador, he is a Ghanaian hip hop artist, meaning he is from Ghana. He grew up in Ghana and um, he, he toured as Blitz the ambassador and uh, he took $40,000 of his savings and made a movie in Ghana, I think five years ago now, called Burial of Kojo, that is truly an art film. And um, uh, there's a one minute teaser of it that would blow your mind with the imagery. Um, he, is, he is currently a novelist. He started out as a fine artist, a painter, he's a musician, and he's a film director. He, uh, did Black is King with Beyonce, which is not a feature film, but certainly showcased his visual style and his magical realism. And then he decided he wanted to uh, try to direct Hollywood movies. This is his first Hollywood movie, pretty damn big one, went from 40,000 to a lot. Um, and um, so I first heard about the project um, while I was cutting uh, Father the Bride for Warner Brothers. And um, my agent called me and said, the studio called, and they'd like to have you meet with Blitz Bazawule about the remake of The Color Purple. And I was just like, oh no, they're confused. Um, I'm not like the musical guy, and I need to just remove myself from this. And um, Melanie went, okay, John, you're, that's really good. And she called Paul Omri, and Paul Omri said, no, 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 I've known John for a long time. We're just trying to find a good partner for Blitz. Scott Sanders and Blitz want a partner. And I said, okay, let me call Paul and talk him out of it. And it didn't work. He said the same thing to me. And uh, so I met with Blitz, and I was in the middle of crazy cutting, and I thought, okay, this is going to be like a half hour, 45 minutes. It was a two-hour interview. He played me a whole bunch of songs. He asked all kinds of interesting questions. Um, he pitched me his version of The Color Purple, which convinced me why this movie should be made, which was basically that when he got the project, he was like, we need a reason to remake the color purple. And um, his reason was Seeley's fantasies. He was rereading uh, Alice Walker's amazing book. And he came up with the idea of going deep into her fantasies, which is really not so much in the Spielberg movie, and using magical realism and fantasies to take us into these musical numbers. They're not all like that. Some of them are quite diegetic and come out of, you know, exactly where we are. But that really was his pitch, and it kind of blew me away. What, what really completely sold me in that meeting, because I was like, I'm not going to get this, was Color Purple is all about trauma. Trauma is just the base of it. And it's very difficult to get over that. And I told him, honestly, I usually shy away from stuff like that. I'm kind of a wimp. But what really sold me is that really what the movie was about is overcoming that and resilience and love and the power of friendship and the ability for anyone to overcome whatever is in their lives that's slowing them down, hurting them. We all have things. We're all, you know, you know, as Oprah Winfrey has said, this is a movie for anyone who was ever an underdog. I think that's everyone. Um, and I was very moved and Blitz is a very, very thoughtful guy. And by the end of it, I was like, wow, I really want to do this. But in the middle of doing it, when I was trying to talk Blitz out of hiring me, I said, you know, you should really hire Tom Cross. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, and then I said, so Blitz, I need to tell you like what my favorite musicals are because you'll have a sense and this will this will help you a little bit decide if I'm someone you want to be talking to because they're unusual. Um, and I said, so the first one is uh, Walk the Line, which uh, my friend Jay Roach insists is not a musical, which I understand. And I say it is because it's a story told on the stage through the music. And then I said, Jimmy Cliff, the harder they come, because it took me to a whole new place. And the music was as big a part as the story and the characters. And that really appealed to me. And then I said, Summer of Soul, because no movie has ever made me feel better about kind of everything. And then I said, I really like singing in the rain, too, just to throw that one in there. And Blitz kind of laughed. And, you know, now here I am 
you know, two years later. And I think we both had a different vision for what a musical could be, and we shared it. And that's how we come to the color purple. And it's really interesting because you don't know until you get a movie in front of an audience as how they will perceive it. Blitz and I both really wanted to make a movie for an audience. We were not making, it's Blitz's vision. We were not making just Blitz's vision. This is a legacy. And part of something that's a legacy, people would ask me, so what is it? Is it a remake of Steven Spielberg's 1985 movie? Is it a filmed play, a, a filmed version of the musical? And I said, no, Alice Walker wrote this amazing book, which in prep, I listened to it three times. She read, she reads the, the book, which is, takes her seven hours and it's a 250 page book. I listened to it three times through. I heard so much nuance so much detail. I heard what the what was important to her and it was amazing. It just as much as what Blitz had told me, it was what I knew I had to honor as well. And honestly, I would say Color Purple, you can't say it's not a musical because it has 15 numbers, but it was interesting for us when we were doing friends and family screenings and um, mostly with them, we would ask people, so do you think it's a musical? And Many people would say, yeah, of course, it's a musical. And then other people would say, no, it's a drama with music. And that was, we both really liked that because it's, it's, there's something about musicals that can feel out of date. And the biggest problem in a musical is how you get in and out of, and that's something we talked about, how you get in and out of the numbers. Like, are you, like someone actually said to me, it's almost like you're cutting two genres of movies together and you you feel that shift i think that was our greatest focus was how can we make this one movie that happens to have 15 musical numbers and it is a musical you can't say it's not i know you've done a lot of comedy and some drama uh, i don't really see any big action but i do consider musicals to be like action movies in their own right because you have what are often these massive set pieces in the form of musical numbers. And it would seem like that type of production would have a bigger impact on you as an editor in terms of putting possibly some restrictions or boundaries on what you could do in post, as opposed to what you could do in a film like Bombshell or Meet the Parents, for example. But we'll see. But to get into all that, let's start talking about creating and managing that material and turning it into a movie. So very simple first question, where did the film shoot and were you cutting on location or where were you cutting during that time? Blitz lives in Atlanta, and um, the movie is written to take place on the coast of Georgia, near Savannah, and it's entirely shot in Atlanta. The studios were in Atlanta, and a lot of it is shot uh, near Savannah and on the coast, and little a little town that Blitz found that looked like it was still left in 1909. Blitz also has a teenage son named Jai, and he wanted to do the director's cut there. So I was for seven months, I was in Atlanta and uh, it was a great experience and cutting at company three. So I wasn't near the set, but I was at the lab, which was great. And we could screen stuff, which was fantastic. And, you know, you never know when you, an, an editor and a director start a new relationship. You know, I've worked on 13 movies with Jay Roach. I can walk in and we have a shorthand. And what amazed me about Blitz is if he had a night shoot, he'd come in in the morning and work with me. If he had a day that ended with sunset at 6.30, he'd come in at night and work with me. And of course, there were always the weekends that I was most often working because I loved the movie and wanting to take it further. So from day one, he was coming into the cutting room. And in my work with Jay Roach, I would make an output for him every week and he would watch it. And sometimes we would talk about cuts, but more than anything, it was for him to get a sense of the movie and see what was going in and out. And he would give me notes and stuff. I said, Blitz, do you want to look at these and give me notes? He said, no, 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 no. This is how I want to work. I want to come in. I want to sit with you, watch whatever is recut, you know, whatever you have. We'll watch it and we'll sit and talk about it and we'll come up with notes together. And that's what we did through the entire movie. And I would say I probably spent 40% of the editor's cut working on the director's cut because he just wanted to get the movie closer and closer and keep trying things. And the most amazing thing for me is because I would show him something on, let's say, week three, and on week five, I got a new idea. I didn't have to say, hey, I'm going to try this or I'm going to show you. I would just recut it and show him something different. 
You know, the movie has a lot of beautiful wonders. There was one day I cut, before I'd ever cut any of the, the wonders up, I cut up a one minute and 15 second wonder into uh, like five cuts that were like 15 or 20 seconds. And he was like, no, 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 no. You, you really can't do that. This is designed to be wonder. I'm like, okay. And then I put it back. And the next time he came in, he was like, okay, that thing you tried before that I said no to, why don't you put it back? Let's live with it for a while. And that's just part of the Blitz who's learning as he goes and is so open. And by the end of the movie, he's like, I can't believe I ever said you couldn't cut that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you were near the lab. What was Blitz shooting in terms of cameras and upwards of how many would he be working with at one time to capture these big performances? Okay, that's a great question. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my first meeting with Blitz after I got the job. He showed me the movie. He said, okay, I'm going to show you the movie. And the movie was a thousand storyboards that Blitz had drawn. And he made it very clear to me. He draws slowly. He said, these are all shots that are going to be in the movie. Obviously, there'll be other shots, but these take too long for me to to draw. And he showed me the movie. It was about two hours, two hours, 15 minutes. It had storyboards, dance rehearsals that he shot on video, um, along with Fatima and all the dancers. And it had rough versions of all the songs. And it had a few uh, VFX previs in there. So it really was wa like watching a movie. And after I watched the movie, he said, you know, I watched you. I wrote down every time you laughed. I wrote time every time you got, uh, I wrote down every time you got emotional. And this is a way for me to just communicate to you what I want the movie to be. So the reason I'm saying that about the storyboards is those shots are all shots he got. And he and Dan Lostin, who shot such a beautiful movie, we did shoot 185, which Blitz and Dan decided would be a more immersive format. And I, I honestly have always really liked it. And I think on home video, sometimes you lose a lot in the widescreen view. And this is a movie about performance and emotion. And uh, I think it was a really good choice. We shot digitally with Arri Minis mostly, primarily the Arri Mini camera. They did not shoot a huge amount of film. You know, you hear about like uh, Sam Restivo is a good friend of mine. And, you know, Ridley Scott shoots the, well, those battle scenes with like 11 cameras. There were quite a few scenes that had two cameras which is very useful. There were a couple that had three, but there was never anything more than three cameras. Dan and Blitz were both very specific about the kind of shots. And sometimes I would use more B camera than Blitz actually like me. He said, you know, let's just find a different way to do that. The images were so important to him. Another thing he said to me, just to digress, when we first met is every frame is going to look like a painting. And I was like, wow, that's great to shoot for. And right now, I kind of feel like almost Im every image is like a painting. And that was kind of more important. I think you'll notice in the film that for a musical, which today are usually really cut fast, that's not the style that we were approaching. Blitz wanted to make an elegant, grounded, intimate movie. And I would say I did all I could to not cut. Uh, like many editors, I believe that there needs to be a reason to cut. So some of these musical sequences, there's one that's got like a two minute wonder in it. Others like Taraji P. Henson's amazing push to button is quite cutty. And that's just because she gave so many different choices to me and so many great moments. And she takes over the screen. The footage told me, she told me, okay, go with this one. You know, the, the opening musical number, or the, the second one, Mysterious Ways with the whole town going to church, does get quite cutty. And I defy anyone not to be tapping their feet to that song. But there are others that are much more relaxed. And I think that's a quality that exists in the movie that we're not really, we were trying not to. I, I, I'll have to let an audience tell me. We're trying not to push emotion on people. We were trying to not push people to feel things and let the characters and the story do its work. And yet we didn't want a three hour movie, which we easily could have had a three hour first cut. 
And the movie is now, without the credits, it's about two hours and 10 minutes, and half of it is musical numbers. Half of it is drama. And we sort of have a shorthand with the audience. We fly through decades. I mean, we go from 1909 into the 1950s. So it's an epic, but it's not a really long epic. And we ask the audience to go with us. We have some, some time stamps, but they're just to let you know time is going by. They're not really incredibly specific. We never felt like that was that important. We felt what was important was the emotion. And we were trying to let the movie breathe. We didn't try and make it short by speeding through scenes. We tried to find what we could take out, some in songs, some in the drama, to be able to keep people in the world. And if they could follow along and not feel like we were going bing, bomb, musical number, back and forth, we would get away with it. And so far, we've only screened the movie a few times. So far, I feel like we did a decent job of pulling that off. In terms of getting your arms around the material in the cutting room, does it start with doing these numbers as group clips and multicam sequences? I've heard of editors of musicals doing super groups as a way of managing things. What was your approach to building these sequences? Pretty straightforward, just like a dialogue scene that had two or three cameras, just grouped clips. Because again, there were never... You know, like on Greatest Showman, there were cases where we had six, eight, nine cameras. And actually, I found that I found that a little cumbersome, and I reduced it to four cameras. It was easier to see. But pretty much, just like a normal movie, the musical scenes weren't built that differently than anything else. And I do tend to be a little like, just get me the film, let me start playing with it. Um, I did want it grouped. I didn't want to drive everyone crazy. And I liked being up to camera. And I liked that any day Blitz would come in, I would have everything in. It would all be there because he could surprise me on any day. There were days I came in at five in the morning and I'm like, it's 7.30, I'm going to go home. And I would always check with his assistant and she'd say, oh, I think Blitz is going to be there around 9.30 and we'd work till one in the morning. And I, of course, wouldn't tell him I was there since five. But, uh, you know, honestly, it was such a pleasure. And I feel so lucky to have been able to work on a film like this that to me, movies are about story, character, and emotion. I feel like I'm really lucky to be a storyteller, and I'm in great gratitude about that. It's interesting hearing that anecdote about Blitz doing all those storyboards, slowly, but doing them. And also that bit between you and he about taking the wonder and then cutting it and him realizing, you know, I actually wasn't a bad move by you. And I will say, there are a lot of wonders still in the movie that shouldn't have been cut. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I'll ask you about those too. But what there are at times sort of high energy transitions between shots and scenes. Mm -hmm. Because of the highly choreographed nature of the material, did they have to be predetermined? Or are you able to manufacture how and when they happen? It's interesting. Transitions are obviously a big part of this film because there are so many of them and there's so many styles that we're mixing of the songs, you know, of the songs that, you know, are happening in real life, like Mysterious Ways and Suge's actually at that juke performing Push a Button versus the fantasy sequences where all of a sudden we're in Seely's head and we're on a giant gramophone, which by the way, that was a VFX previs. And I couldn't believe it. He shot that the first week. And Joe Binford, our Atlanta assistant, just screamed, you guys, you guys, come in here. You got to look at this. They shot that practical. The horn was added digitally. She's actually on a giant gramophone. And Faraji's in the bathtub. And she's singing to her. It was kind of amazing. So many of those transitions were written in. In fact, that one in particular was written in. You know you're in the room with Taraji, who's drunk and in the bathtub, and she asks Seely to start the gramophone up for her. And then Seely just can't believe she's with this gorgeous woman, and she looks over at the gramophone, and the needle's going around, and all of a sudden, we're there, and we pull out from a record, and we're in this new place. There are many things like that that are in the movie that work perfectly. But as you know, sometimes things don't work exactly like that. Sometimes you need to take something out. Sometimes the vision you had for that is tricky. And we come up with something different. As a, for instance, in uh, the scene, What About Love, which is one of my favorite numbers, and probably the, the one that seems, it, it's almost an old fashioned Hollywood movie number on an old fashioned Hollywood set. They're watching a black and white movie and we cut to that black and white movie, Flying Aces. 
which was an all African American movie from silent film from the 20s. And our transition wasn't working into the movie set the way it should have. And we kept experimenting and finding ways. And in the end, it was something so simple that made it work. We just cut to a high shot of the piano and went, wait, what if we see the plane that was in the movie in the reflection of the top of the piano? And we pull out and all of a sudden we discovered what would really work. And I think that's kind of the beauty of movie making. Some things work as planned and some things you, you have to scratch your head and figure out and go, what's important here? How do we do this? And it's an interesting mix of those in the film. You know, earlier you said, I still approach it somewhat from a dialogue standpoint, the way I would do a more traditional film, for lack of a better term. Do you just do sort of a linear cut of that sequence where it's shot to shot to shot going to another scene? Or do you do the separate scenes first and then stitch those together? Every scene is kind of different. I would watch all the dailies first. I would make some notes and then just jump in and start cutting. And, you know, it, it just depends what the coverage is like and how the scene is working. Everyone kind of feels different. But like in mysterious ways, I just sort of, you know, I, I mean, maybe there were 40 takes of each moment in different setups. I would just look at them all. And honestly, I think the first thing, in, especially in a musical number, that's not like Mysterious Ways isn't that much story until we're really in the church and we see young Celie and that she's pregnant and her sister is different and her dad's there. Story is involved in all of these musical numbers. That's also why I think story and character help drive the musical numbers as well as the drama. So it really would depend. Like Mysterious Ways, I knew it was going, you know, A to B to C to D, and there there were many different segments. And some of those got trimmed. That scene was quite long, and I think we, we found a really good place for it. And so I would just honestly go through and put in the pieces that I, I felt, well, this has to be in the movie. Then you have kind of have a whole scene to look at. And then I'd go back and watch all the dailies again and go, oh, what about this? What about that? What about, you know, and that scene starts very slowly in terms of cutting and keeps building and building. It starts with a long oneer. It has a giant oneer in the middle of it with dialogue and music is not up front. It's underneath. And then it ends going into the church and in a very cutty scene where you feel the power and importance of the church. And this young woman who's 14 years old and pregnant, and God does work in mysterious ways. And, and you know, every, every scene is kind of different. It's hard to say. I, I think it's instinct more than anything. This sounds like a cliche, but, you know, cliches, I guess, become cliches because they should be. They're repeated often. The footage just kind of talks to you and tells you what you should be doing. I, I think that's part of the job of an editor is watch the dailies and see what it could be. And then some scenes change a lot. Others don't change that much. You certainly underscored that performance is what's driving your decision and now instinct. When I watch these musicals that have these big choreographed numbers, you mentioned Taraji's many takes that she did, and you would wonder how different can the performances really be in these multiple takes? You would assume it's really more about the physical aspects as well as whether or not the choreography worked, not so much different delivery of the lines. Again, you said it's your instinct. It's my instinct to decide, and eventually for Blitz and I to decide. And he did always make selects of what his favorite takes were. But as always, you know, you, you look at those and you take them seriously, but you put in whatever you think works the best and you find, you find the best combo. She would do different things so often. And look, Taraji is not 22 years old. They shot that scene all night. And Blitz said to me, it was amazing. The, the dancers are all like 23 and they're all huffing and puffing. And it's like four o'clock in the morning and Taraji's going, let's go. The sun's coming up. We got to do some more. And Taraji was just a force of nature. And she gave so many different things. She's playing the character while she's singing. And also, Taraji is an actress who is not known as a singer. She has sung, but Blitz filled this movie with actors who hadn't sung before on camera and singers who hadn't acted before. Fantasia, this is, she, she'd acted in the Broadway musical, but this is her first movie. Her first movie. And I think being a musician, and a filmmaker directing musicians and actors was really helpful for him because there was a certain risk factor in that. And uh, I think everyone knew what movie they were working on. For the onset aspect of it, 
you know, you would typically think that everyone's performing to playback. And I think that's most often the case, but I have heard of instances where people are actually recording on set. How was that element handled for this film? Most of the recording, I was always hoping there would be more live recording with Fantasia. She has a number near the end of the film, I'm Here, which was kind of the big number in the play. It's her just singing. Some of it was done to playback, quite a bit of it is live. And you can tell, I mean, she's just, she's in the performance. She's in the emotion of it. And when she sings, I'm beautiful, it's pretty heartbreaking. And that's because that's live. Most of the music uh, was pre-recorded. And a lot of the songs are, you know, some of the songs are rock and roll, but most of them are gospel, which Blitz had Ricky Dillard come in and produce the gospel with him. He's a gentleman on the playing the piano, going through town with a horse. Christian McBride, who's playing with John Baptiste when Taraji sings Seely's Blues, was helping him produce uh, the jazz. And Kebmo, who's on camera singing Pushed a Button, in Pushed a Button, was helping Blitz produce all the blues music. So he had this whole cadre of people who knew the, the gamut of black music from 1909 into the 1950s. And that kind of affected everything. Generally on a film, work, quote, flows from editorial and from media composer out to the sound editing and mixing teams into Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. Does the sound workflow in post change at all in a musical where that order might be a little bit different? You know, I like to do uh, friends and families right out of the avid and not do temp dubs. And obviously that's more complicated on a musical like this. Nick Baxter, who was along with Blitz and Stephen Bray, who worked on the original musical, were all three executive music producers. And Nick did a lot of the technical work of creating the original playback numbers. I was constantly bothering him and go, I need a separate piano track. I need it. He's like, that's for later. We do that later. When you're done, I take it and then we make it wider. And I, I just said, Nick, I need this stuff. I need to make this work. I need a horn separate. I just kept asking for more. And it allowed me to make it closer and for us to find where we were going with the mix. Blitz always wanted these things to feel like they were live. And we found a great balance between perspective and, you know, the way you would normally do it. You know, you've got a guy on a trombone and you're on him, you're going to hear that louder. We found a good balance there where you never felt that you weren't in the environment. You felt like you were there, but we, we had that ability to shift around. And I think that's what set up how uh, it ended up being mixed in the movie by Paul Massey and Julian Slater. Another thing we did, because I like to preview, I mean, do just do friends and families as early as possible. You know, a lot of this was new to Blitz. And he said, what's the most important thing for us to do in the director's cut? And I said, show the movie to people and learn what the problems are before we're showing the studio. He was like, great, man, it's a quick study. And uh, we were aiming to do that. And in order to do that, I relied on Renee Tondelli, who I've worked with for years, and Julian Slater were the co-sound supervisors. Renee was also working on uh, Rob Marshall's Little Mermaid simultaneously and would kind of borrow time and go back and forth. Renee would do stuff like get all the dancers and some floor and have Richard Bullock, the sound recordist, record all the dance foley on the set and then cut it for me. So I had real dancers doing the foley. She said, the worst thing is I work on these musicals. And then months later, I'm with someone who is a dancer, but didn't dance these numbers and it's the wrong floor and it just never sounds right. So we had that. Julian Slater, who had done Baby Driver, which had a similar thing. You know, so many of the sound effects are syncopated to the music. We're doing that all the time. We're using hammers and other things to prelap and bring us into things. When Mr. is about to, we're, we're about to cut to Taraji in her red crazy outfit in the swamp, Celie says, Suge wants to make an entrance. And Mr. is really bummed that he's not going with Suge. And he turns and he sucks his teeth and he closes his watch. That watch close is right on beat with the snapping prelapped music from the guys in the boat. We were doing stuff like that all the time. And so much of that made it into the movie. Also, Caradine El Hello, who was my first assistant at first, and then also additional editor the last few months of the movie. He certainly earned his right 
than to just be cutting. And early on, he was really helping me with the sound. I was like, we need to do something. And, you know, we'd sit in his room sometimes for a couple hours, like the scene when Seely hears about the funeral. We were never going to hear the other side of it, but we're in Memphis. We're in this beautiful house. There's a party going on. And I said, let's try just sucking all the sound out and just reverbing it. That was the first scene we did it on. And it's very similar now. It's it's done, you know, Paul Massey and Julian got in there and, and it's done to a, a more thorough version, but it's very much what Carradine worked out in the beginning with me. And there's probably four or five places in the movie we do that. And I think they're memorable and they make you realize something's going on that's going to be important. So all of those things were things that I felt had to be in the movie before we showed people. Yet, I don't want to give up a week for a temp dub and waste a bunch of money on a temp dub. Sorry, I love mixers, I love sound, but I like to keep picture moving. Uh, we just learn the most that way. So it is sort of complicated because we're not waiting for a final mix or a nine day temp dub. Eventually, before we previewed, we did go and have serious temp dubs with music pre-dubs and everything. And honestly, it's not until you see the final movie that Nick Baxter and Blitz have a chance to change some things and bring in new instrumentation and change arrangements a little bit. And it's definitely more alive now than it ever was. But when you saw this movie really early in the middle of the director's cut, you had a good sense of where we were heading. So we've talked a few times about wonners and the need to keep things flowing. Mm -hmm. There is a 360 degree shot inside Seeley's room transitioning from young Seeley to Fantasia. There is a whip pan from Sophia to Harpo and Seeley after she does the hell no number. Mm -hmm. Those are bits that I would think you'd have to have some sort of editorial sleight of hand, you know, unless they're able to pull off some sort of elaborate Texas switch in the 360 thing. For every edit that's obvious to the viewer, how many more anecdotally anyway, do you feel like you have as like fluid morphs or splits or just little hidden tricks to help stitch these things together? The sequence you're talking about, there's actually two of them where the time goes by. Also when Sophia is in jail, it's a similar thing. So that was actually a rare occasion where they used motion control. And you see young Seely in two of the passes. You see the little kids run through and then you see Fantasia come on. We introduce grown up Fantasia in that sequence. That's really what it's about. And then she comes in and, and sings a little bit of a song and we're all of a sudden in grown up world. It's a big transition in the movie that was done motion control. And then we changed the, the windows were blue screen and we changed the seasons as we went through. That's exactly how Blitz planned it. So it's one cut with many, many many elements. The the other one you brought up at the end of Hell No, which is it's one of my favorite little moments in the movie, the choreography is amazing. Fatima, who is our choreographer, Blitz, when he grew up in Ghana, he said she did every great hip hop video. And when he first pitched the movie, she was the one crew member. He said, we have to have Fatima. And it's amazing modern choreography that works in a period movie. We kind of cross a great line there. So We've got all the sisters lined up, the seven sisters, and they're all moving their necks around and they go, hell no. And then, yes, it's a whip pan. That was that take. I could have switched takes, but it was that take. You know, I did speed it up a little. I did blow up as we went by, blow up and repo to get to a different angle. But that was exactly how Blitz had planned it. And I think it's really effective. You know, you also mentioned fluid morphs, which <laughs> it's funny. I have a very unusual relationship with things like fluid morphs and split screens. Back in the film days, I would do split screens all the time. I was told on two movies that you have done the most fluid morphs, repos and blow ups of any person we ever knew of. I was told by a very experienced visual effects editor. Nobody does all this. And it's just something that, um, you know, fluid morphs allow you to take out pauses at their most simple, and they, they allow you to take what the actor is doing and yet not change their performance, but change the rhythm and blow ups as well. I mean, we did shoot digitally and we were able to blow things up. There's a lot of push ins. There's probably more VFX in this movie than you would think. And there's many more of these, I'll call them editorial VFX, that we can now pull off these days. And 
you know, this is an editing podcast, so it's okay to talk about it because it's sort of black magic in a way like, oh, should you even say that? And, you know, I know people who said, I don't think that's right to do a fluid morph. And I respect anyone who wants to do what they want. And said, isn't that interfering with the actor's performance? And, you know, I don't feel like it is. I was very clear with Blitz. I've tried this. And he was like, wow, that's kind of cool. Remember that thing you did? Why don't we do one of those here? You know, <laughs> it's just a it's just a, a tool. And I think what's interesting about a movie like this is the VFX aren't obvious at all. Some of them are. And the giant gramophone, probably everyone thought that was a big visual effect and just the horn. That's really it. No, I think the only VFX thing that I really kind of noted, and I think it's just sort of a stylistic thing, is Seely coming out of the prison and the lightning in the sky kind of yes. thing. It's like, well, you're dealing with weather there, yeah. so you, you kind of expect it to be VFX. Yes, yes, that, that is definitely a VFX, yeah. I want to talk about that shot. It's the recall of Hell No, which is Sophia's signature song. It's an anthem. It's funny, in the play, it was kind of a sad song, and... It's a rock and roll anthem. And the way Danielle Brooks performs it is it's amazing and it's really righteous. And Blitz shot that with Seely in slow-mo at 48. So Fantasia had to sing at double speed. And honestly, the music folks were like, you can't expect her to sing at double speed. It's never going to work. And, you know, it's natural fear because how is that going to work? And of course it was hard to sing. There were lots of takes. But there's a quality to her coming out. You're not even sure what it is, I think, the first time you see it. But the guards, the the the, the prison guards in the background are moving in slow-mo. Everything's in slow-mo except her. And um, actually, the opening shot of the movie is done that way. We're up high over Mr. playing the banjo on the horse. And we're using the clip-clop, which is over the, the logos. So the, the horse hooves are percussion. And Mr. is shot in slow-mo. Well, it was all shot in slow-mo. And then we ramped up to get the girls to sing in sync at 24 frames per second. And again, there's a quality to it that you can't exactly put your eyes on and go, what, what, did, what was that? But it's something unusual. And Blitz was never afraid of experimenting and trying stuff like that. And I think it paid off. I think there's a lot of little subtle speed changes that really help the film. John, this editing thing sounds like a lot of work. You know what's funny? People watch the movie and go, wow, it's so much work. And you know what's funny to me? I just love this film. I love being able to work on something that is, on a human level, so powerful to me. I can't tell you what an audience would say, but it's very powerful to me. It changed me. It changed how I look at things. It changed my outlook on life in some ways, all to a very positive extent. You know, if you can overcome hardship with art, what's better than that? And I'm not saying anything bad about all the comedies. I love the comedies I worked on. You know, Hollywood can pigeonhole you. There's also, to quote Mike Myers, it's like freaking heroin when you're in a movie theater and people are laughing and you've helped create that. That's an equally good feeling to have. But this movie worked on a really deep level for me, and I really connected to it and felt a responsibility to it. You know, something interesting I'd like to bring up, which I think is unusual, and I think if someone who hadn't seen the movie, they'd be very surprised, but there's quite a bit of humor in The Color Purple, a surprising amount of humor. And to me, it's all about tension release. I think a good example is the dinner scene, which is the biggest, longest dialogue scene in the film. I think it's like five minutes now, maybe four. But all eight characters are all there. Hugely dramatic things are happening. It's the end of the second act, breaking into the third act. Sophia's come out of jail. She's basically mute. She's gone. The most lively person, she's gone. And she comes back to life. Celie is going to leave. She's the victim who's going to leave the perpetrator. I mean, it's intense. And... Harpo's there dealing with his current girlfriend, his wife who's come back. It's very complicated for all of them. Mr. finds out he's outed. And the movie, we build up tension. And at a certain point, you know, especially in the beginning of the movie, people are really happy when the movie, we deliver on the trauma. But then we know we have to give people a chance to reset. And neither Blitz or I shied away from if there was a joke to be had, 
can we take it? Because then an audience has a chance to release that tension. And then you can sort of take a breath and build the tension back up. And I think it happens in that scene four or five times. Uh, to, we meet Jean Baptiste. It's the second scene. He's in the movie and he gets a couple of great laughs. And, you know, Harpo's like, oh, no, not again. He does. I mean, I have him do that a couple of times. And even if it's not an out loud laugh, it goes, you know, you, it just feels so human. And I think that's part of the success of the movie is that you have this dichotomy of feeling and reaction. And, you know, for me, I love all kinds of films. I love indie movies. I love Hollywood movies. I, I love them all. The only kind of movie that I really have trouble with sometimes is when it's a drama that's so serious that there's never any humor. Because my feeling in real life is when stuff gets dark, when stuff gets difficult, humor is what gets you through. In real life, there's never not humor. And I feel the loss of it. And that was a big pleasure for me on this film. We weren't ever going for a joke like you would in a comedy. It wasn't like that. But seeing that side of life, I think, helps the movie have an emotional impact at the very end that it might not have had if the tones hadn't shifted. And shifting tones is not easy. I don't typically ask about the producers, but in this case, you have some pretty heavy hitters involved. Yes, yes, we do. This project has quite a legacy. And Blitz had a really open collaborative relationship with Oprah Winfrey, Scott Sanders, and Steven Spielberg. They saw the movie, I think, a couple weeks into the director's cut. He felt confident showing them a first version of the movie. He wanted their input early. Oprah and Scott didn't necessarily have as many specific notes along the way, but Blitz always listened to them. And honestly, we never got a note that we did not try and watch in context from anyone from the studio or anything like that, which I think is a great way to work. And um, Stephen gave us detailed notes from the very beginning. And uh, I'll say they were the most actionable, practical, useful notes I've ever received. You know, sometimes notes are like development notes. And Stephen's were just like, you know, these are filmmaker notes. Hey, what if you cut from here to here? What if you lost this? What if you moved this there? And we would try every single one of them. There's a fair amount of them that really ended up in the movie. And then one day, Stephen came and he spent, like I think, five, six hours with us in the cutting room. And what was fascinating is he had forgotten his notes at home. And he said, let's just watch, let's just scroll through the movie and I'll, I'll remember everything. So we scrolled through the movie and, and it was just a discussion. Hey, what about if you did this? What about this? Hmm, why'd you do this? And we spent all that time and he was just incredibly respectful. Like this is a man who's watching a movie that is not a remake of his movie, but similar. And he was so generous and so open and so respectful of Blitz and respectful when we took a note, respectful when we didn't. It was really a pleasure to have that experience with him. And uh, I, I think working on this film was kind of amazing because you know how most people, certainly most movies I've worked on, you know, the first week is always everyone's finding their way, you know, they're just getting together and you shoot the easy stuff. Blitz said, I'm not going to shoot the easy stuff. I'm going to shoot the stuff that is the most important to the movie in the first four weeks. He shot all the fantasy scenes, lots of big musical numbers, like lots of big stuff, the kind of stuff that any line producer would say, what are you doing? So four weeks in, every Friday, we would make an output and I would bring my crew in to watch. And there weren't a lot of us, there was five of us, two assistants, a PA and a VFX editor. And at four weeks in, I had 40 minutes of cut footage and I screened it for them. And they sat there and they didn't say anything. And I was like, I waited five minutes and I said, what's going on? And they all said, we're just so emotionally wrought. We can't really use words now. And then the next day, Julia, my wife of 400 years, would come with me. She was in Atlanta with me the whole time. And I'd work in the morning and we'd go have a nice lunch and come home and watch everything. The exact same thing happened. And she was like, I don't know what to say. She eventually called it the medicine movie because even then, it was emotional. And I have to say that all of us who worked on this movie felt, you know, in post, that's, that's all I can talk about, felt like we were given an opportunity to do something 
I don't want to say important, but to, uh, an opportunity to do something that really felt good, that was important, that was honoring a piece of literature, honoring amazing performances, honoring Blitz's vision. And it's rare today to be able to work on a movie that doesn't take itself too seriously, but has some ambition to it, and let alone a studio movie. And I take my hat off to Warner Brothers for letting Blitz make this movie. And as proud of I am of all the movies I've worked on, in a way, this is the one that's closest to my heart. And everyone contributed to this movie every step of the way. You guys hit all the right notes. Thank you. You're very kind. Indeed, they did hit all the right notes. This is a great looking film and obviously a great sounding film. And that is thanks in no small part to the talents of our guest, John Paul. A big thank you to John for joining us today and giving us an inside look on how they created a fresh take on a book, a film, and a musical that each had a big impact in their own right. Something that would have a big impact on your career is being up on all the latest features and functionality available in Avid Media Composer. New features are being added to the legendary nonlinear editing system all the time. Things like AI-enhanced script sync and phrase find tools that can make you a more efficient editor and help you spend more of your time telling a great story. Once again, make sure you check out the podcast show notes for a link that will take you right over to the Media Composer page on avid.com. Well, that'll do it for today. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned a thing or two. And I hope you come back again next week for another episode. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. The Rough Cut.